evening. I'm Kelly Cart. And I'm Rick Lord. Thank you for joining us on this somber anniversary. It has now been 10 years since the Upper Big Branch Mine disaster forever changed the state of West Virginia. Tonight, we will be revisiting the stories of families and communities who are still trying to heal from their devastating loss. 29 men taken in the nation's worst coal mining disaster in 40 years. 29 families left to carry on their memories, many of them coming here to the Upper Big Branch Miners Memorial in Whitesville to reflect and to remember. For the next half hour, we will be taking a look back at the disaster, examine what's changed in mine safety over the last decade, and visit with the families who are still dealing with unimaginable grief. But first, Eyewitness News reporter Leslie Rubin recounts the chain of events that happened when disaster struck. It's mid-afternoon on the Monday after Easter, April 5th, 2010. Word starts to spread. There's been an explosion deep inside the Upper Big Branch Mine near Mont Cole. They told me there'd been an explosion. <laughs> and I said, where? And they said, performance. Eight o'clock that night, Massey Energy confirmed seven miners are dead and at least 19 others unaccounted for. Five hours later, hope starts to fade as 25 miners are confirmed dead and four still missing. We have four unaccounted, four miners, and we're going to do everything in our power and in the mine rescue team's power to locate those people alive. An agonizing four days pass. It is what it is and this is what we're dealing with right now. Uh, it's nothing compared to what the families are going through. With around the clock press conferences. We've had a setback. Updating the nation about the search for the four missing and the recovery of those killed. If we have any hope of survival and they're in a rescue chamber, they're still okay. That's, I mean, that's the sliver of hope we have and it's, it's a long shot. Everyone's been upfront about that because this was a horrible blast. But if they're there, they're okay. Just after midnight on April 10th, Governor Joe Manchin confirms the worst. We did not receive the miracle that we prayed for. Uh, we have accounted for four miners that have been unaccounted for. We have a total of 29 brave miners uh, who are, who are recovering at this time. Three days later, investigations into the blast are announced. Manchin appoints mine safety expert David McAteer to conduct an independent investigation. This investigation will, as we've done in the past, let the facts drive the conclusion. April 25th, President Barack Obama attends a memorial service for the miners. How can we let anyone in this country put their lives at risk by simply showing up to work? by simply pursuing the American dream. A day later, Massey's board defends the company's safety performance and tells reporters that the mine was in good condition before the explosion, with routine checks being done just minutes before the blast. All the indicators are that at the start of the shift, everything was okay. At the end of 2010, Massey announces its polarizing CEO, Don Blankenship, will retire, a deal that gives him $12 million in cash. Blankenship had been with Massey since 1982 and served as CEO for 10 years. I realize we all have a role to play in life and uh, people play that role. I do think that people need to search their heart and their mind for truth and uh, try to base their positions on that. A little more than a month later, Alpha Natural Resources announces it's buying Massey in a $7.1 billion deal. February 2011, Massey Security Chief Huey Elbert Stover is charged with lying to UBB investigators and trying to destroy evidence. He is later sentenced to three months in prison. In March, former UVB miner Thomas Harris is charged with faking a foreman's license while performing safety checks at the mine. He pleads guilty and spends 10 months in jail. I do want them to go to jail. If they did the crime, yes, go to jail. That's what they deserve. May 19th, 2011, McAteer releases his report that concludes Massey recklessly ignored safety, allowing dangerous conditions to build inside the UBB mine, along with putting blame on state and federal regulators for failing to adequately enforce mine safety laws. They did not protect or help protect these miners. A report by the UMWA in October 2011 calls UBB industrial homicide and calls on the company's top officers to be prosecuted for operating what they call a rogue company, which completely disregarded safety. A few months later, the U.S. Department of Justice announces a nearly $210 million deal not to prosecute Alpha for any criminal liability it inherited when it bought Massey, but certain individuals can still face charges. 
we're very much focused on continuing the, the investigation of individual wrongdoing. That same day, MSHA releases its own report citing corporate culture as the root cause for the disaster. Systemic and intentional efforts by PCC and Massey to avoid compliance with safety and health standards. Former UBB Mine Superintendent Gary May is charged with conspiracy to violate mine safety laws in February 2012. He later pleads guilty and spends nearly two years in jail. If you put profits over safety, you, know, you risk miners' lives you're going to go to jail. A year later in February 2013, longtime Massey official David Hugert pleads guilty to taking part in a conspiracy to violate mine safety rules and alleges that Blankenship was part of that conspiracy. He threatened my husband's job on numerous occasions. This is common practice, common practice within Massey that they notify guards and anyone else under the property. And if you do not do that, you are fired. Hugert is sentenced to 42 months in prison. November 13th, 2014, more than four years after the explosion, Blankenship is indicted on four charges. Prosecutors said he conspired to violate federal mine safety laws at UBB and provided advanced warning about mine safety inspections. He was also accused of lying about Massey safety practices before the explosion. He was not charged for the miners' deaths or causing the blast. Are you still claiming your innocence right now? <laughs> yeah. During a historic trial that lasted more than two months at the end of 2015, a jury finds Blankenship guilty of one misdemeanor conspiracy charge. There was never enough evidence to justify convicting Mr. Blankenship. He is sentenced to a year in prison. 365 days sounds like a long time for these 29 miners when you break it down. It's just 12 and a half days for each miner he killed. Left to carry on the memory of the 29 men, their friends and families who were forever changed in an instant 10 years ago. Eyewitness News reporter Leslie Rubin sits down with several of those families who say the struggle to move on has been a never ending task. She continues our coverage now. At a mountaintop cemetery. That's a good boy right there though. You can find Tommy Davis. He was something. Alone with his thoughts. I'm thinking, you know, I'm not wonder what Corey would have looked like, his baby would have looked like. I think about that all the time. And talking to his oldest son. I tell him all the time, but he can't hear me. But if I could, I just want him to know that I love him. And I miss him. And I'd like to have another hunt. Corey Boy, he calls him, was the youngest of the miners killed at UBB, a fourth generation coal miner who loved the outdoors. He was just 20. You know, he's not been forgotten, and I won't ever let him be forgotten. I love him too much to just let it go. But Tommy's pain does not start and end here at his son's grave. His brother and nephew also died in the explosion. Tommy was on his way out of the mine when it happened. It's hard for me to love something. It is. Um, I, I, I can't, I struggle. Because everything, pretty much everything in my family wise or anything I've ever done that I loved is gone. For Gary Quarles, the pain comes back in waves. I ain't forgot nothing. His heart as broken today as it was 10 years ago. Who this boy is? and what he meant to me. Recalling the moment he knew his son, Gary Wayne, wasn't coming home. Like nothing that you could ever believe, you don't think it ever happens. Uh, and just wondering, what's the next thing going to be? His friends called him Spanky. He had worked underground starting when he was just 18, confiding in others about the dangerous conditions at UBB just days before it took his life. You kept your mouth shut and you did what you were supposed to do and you go on. And for all the pain 10 years has brought, Gary says just 10 seconds to say I love you would be enough to bring him the peace he's so desperately searching for. That help a lot. That help a lot to be able to just say that. It's just hard to believe that it's been 10 years because my heart doesn't feel like it's been 10 years. The heart of a mother 
in search of peace too. When I call out these names, I need the families to go in this room. Jason's, his was the third name. And um, from that point on, um, it's kind of a blur. A blur of a decade of emotions in the midst of a mission for justice the Atkinses say they'll never see. We buried our kid because of you. The commercials running for office, uh, trying to get his sentence overturned. And even with former CEO Don Blankenship's conviction and year in prison, the families agree it's not enough for the man who had the power to shut the mine down and ultimately save. 29 lives. He had a part of my son taking my son's life. He had a part. Um, and my son ain't gonna get to live like he always wanted to. His dreams never got fulfilled. Nobody. Nobody's tucked a blank for 29 men being dead. For the 29 families, that is missing. Time is one thing that has certainly passed. First off, I give him a hug. The pain and the hurt. Liam, I love him. Have certainly not. I'm proud of him. I'm, I'm proud of, of the man that he, he had become before he was taken from us. A play currently being performed in New York City tells the story of the UBV miners and their families. It's called Coal Country, and it's interwoven with actual interviews from those family members. <laughs> That's the sound of Steve Earle, who performs the music for the show that makes up his new album called Ghosts of West Virginia. The family's testimonies acting as the building blocks for the documentary style play, which has drawn national attention and has even brought UBB family members to New York City to see it firsthand. The interviews were conducted by director Jessica Blank and her husband Eric Jensen here in West Virginia back in 2016. The words in the play are as the people said them to us. Um, they're not things that we made up. Um, we don't think of this as our story. We think of, our, of ourselves as channels and conduits for the people who lived this to tell their story. Um, so it's really in a West Virginian voice, which is which really struck people here in New York City. There were 500 people working on bringing this play to life. And the emotional connection that each one of those people has to this story is incredibly powerful. There were 250 people in that theater every night crying along with them. The theater was packed before the coronavirus pandemic forced them to stop performances. It's on hold right now, but the goal is to eventually bring the play to West Virginia. Here at the Memorial in Whitesville, it's a monument of importance to any West Virginian, but to the families, it's of monumental importance where they will find special meaning in so many of the displays. On the side of Coal River Road in the heart of coal country, a memorial to the men killed while mining coal. This is where friends and families came when their community was uprooted by disaster at Upper Big Branch. From the moment you step onto this hollowed ground, a sense of the magnitude of what happened that day and all that was lost, including hope hope that they could be saved by the brave first responders and mine rescuers who are honored in bronze, standing at the front of the mine entrance, reaching out a hand to the miners trapped deep underground. A few steps away, a massive black granite memorial, rugged like the Appalachian Mountains, surrounded by coal from the painful UBB mine. On the side, a tribute to all who have worked, been hurt, and been killed in mines. On the other, the miners, etched in stone, life-size men standing shoulder to shoulder. Standing back, you get a sense of who the 29 men were, a symbol of their strength and their sacrifice. Under them, a verse from the book of Matthew calling out, come to me, all you who labor, and I will give you rest. 
a blast happened in Montcole, but just down the road here in Whitesville, this was the closest town. Eyewitness News anchor Whitney Wetzel takes a look at what's changed. It's a very small community. It used to be a, a, a very vibrant, bustling community in the even uh, in the 80s and early 90s uh, when coal was going well. These days, the town of Whitesville looks much different than it once did. It was people on the streets all the time. You know, this was a five and dime. This was Ben Franklin's. Hat ads was next door. And, you know, on down the line, we had the bowling alley and the theater. And but the community still thrives off of one thing. Coal. It's the backbone. It's the blood. The backbone of a community ripped apart by the very thing it relies on to survive. April 5th of 2010, the uh, assistant fire chief came to my residence and the uh, emergency call came across his uh, radio uh, that there had been a, a mining accident. I immediately responded up. It looks like I've got up to potential of 10 deceased currently, um, maybe in excess of 30 total injured. I knew that, that something significant had happened. We're still trying to get all the total number. Uh, they're still bringing a to the surface. It's just, it's, it's a total disaster control. I, I need all the resources you can give me. Their worst fears confirmed. A moment that turned the community upside down in an instant. You know, I remember leaving that night and I remember when we came off the hill, it was just like folks were everywhere. There was, you know, uh, national media, there was so many minor rescuers, so many state police officers. And then I remember the first time traveling back down to home to shower, uh, it was just like, Signs were up everywhere. Everyone was holding in hope. Um, faith was a big thing. I've been up with the family several times, and uh, there's no way to describe the heartbreak. David Minturn, a pastor at a nearby church at the time, provided prayer and comfort to victims' families. He was one of many who watched and waited at a local diner. Glued to the TV, sharing any information they had. There's just a somber. Uh, attitude. Nearly five days of agonizing pain, waiting for any hope of a miracle that never came. The first responders left with a grim task that still haunts them. I'll never forget that the evening that the last body left, it's still, it's still pretty heavy on me because it's just like, what just happened? You know, it was, it was overwhelming. While time has passed, the memory of the disaster has not faded. That's one of those things that you never forget. Tiny tributes still scattered around a town that will never truly heal. It's a constant healing process, and I, and I can only imagine what the families and, and those other coal miners and the mine rescuers, that, uh, that what they go through daily. It's going to be a lifelong uh, recovery for everyone. David Hodges, now a lieutenant at the Charleston Fire Department, trains other first responders in the event of similar tragedies. Since UBB, 52 miners across the state of West Virginia have died on the job. In 2019, 24 miners across the country died in mining accidents. The U.S. Department of Labor says that is the lowest nationwide total ever recorded. And sure, there are fewer miners in general with the downturn in the industry, but there are many who do believe the numbers can be attributed to a more proactive safety approach. So what's changed? I spoke with two men deeply connected to mine safety in West Virginia to get their take on where we were and where we are now. We could have been victims of our own success to somewhat because mining conditions were so improved. Mining accidents were, were uh, striking all-time lows, low number of uh, incidents, and you know, the industry could have been lulled into somewhat of a, a false sense of security. A lull that was shaken by Sago in 2006 and then rocked to its core by Upper Big Branch four years later. Chris Hamilton has made a career of coal. His 40 years of experience include owning a mine safety consulting firm and currently serving as senior vice president of the West Virginia Coal Association. He says we've come a long way since UBB with a renewed and unwavering focus on mine safety. I think the industry has shown a continuous improvement over the past decade. We have the highest trained miners you'll find within any jurisdiction. So we're very proud about that and we're, we're just real pleased to see the safety record improving every day. And the numbers bear that out. 
In the five years leading up to UBB, the number of mine violations doled out in West Virginia each year stayed in the 13,000 to 19,000 range. Over the last eight years, even with stricter enforcement, that number has been steadily declining, coming in under the 10,000 mark in three of the last four years. And other than 2017, the number of deaths has been five or fewer every year since 2014. Eugene White is the director of Miners Health Safety and Training in West Virginia. He says there have been numerous improvements this decade, too many to name, technological, physical, and legislative. But he was quick to answer when asked what was the one thing that has helped the most. The coal mines are rock dusted better today than ever. Every coal company is rock dusting their coal mines. As a mine inspector for much of his career, White knows firsthand about the importance of safety. He was there, on site, in the immediate aftermath of both Upper Big Branch and Sago. Entirely two different scenarios of, of damage and destruction. Different tragedies for different reasons still etched into his memory. The one thing that I'll never forget about UBB is when we were recovering the last nine victims. And the mine rescue guys. We formed a human chain of 140 mine rescue team members. So we had to carry them and we passed them from one team to the other till we got them to the last ride. Person to person, arm to arm, for hundreds if not thousands of feet, over and over and over, until those nine lost miners were at the surface. It has stayed with them for a decade, both disasters, the worst part of coal mining, taking an eternal toll on men like White, who have made it their livelihood. Do you ever get over it? No. No. Mine rescue, Sago changed me. Uh, it changed my life. It changed me as a person. Uh, it's, it's hard. A central figure during the response to the disaster was Joe Manchin. He was governor at the time. We had the chance to sit down with him and reflect on that tragedy and what's changed since then. And immediately we go right to the, to the mine. Looking back, now Senator Joe Manchin can recall the tragedy at Upper Big Branch as if it was yesterday. He says the first priority was clear communication, the mistakes of the Sago mine disaster and incorrectly announcing that 12 miners had survived was a difficult lesson they were not going to repeat. He says phones were confiscated and a line of communication established with a first priority, families. We want to make sure that the families know what we know every two hours, anything, uh, because they're hanging on every word now. Around the clock, day into night. You know that our only chance is if somebody could have gotten to that chamber. Updates to the public in front of hundreds of cameras. Manchin and the others becoming familiar faces on TV while delivering heartbreaking news. We did not receive the miracle we prayed for. But he says it was the moments that no one saw with the families that have stayed with him. I remember sitting there and, and, and uh, at night Around 11 o'clock until about 6 in the morning is when you really got people talking to you because there's nobody else around and they would talk and they want to tell you all the great things and all the wonderful things they've done, the life they've had and things of that sort. The wife of one of the section foremen uh, and uh, her two sisters were sitting with her and they were uh, very quiet and I tried to get a conversation. The next day they wanted to talk and we started talking and they said I knew something would happen. Just a, it was just a matter of time. And then start making you think, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't all, anyone who goes to work be expected to come home safe? But when a family member keeps thinking, I, I always thought this would happen in my, and her husband left her a letter saying, I, something's gonna happen. I'll never forget that. He knew because of the way it was being operated. And Manchin says those late night conversations have guided him over the last 10 years, passing bills to require more personal breathing devices, more rescue chambers, and an anonymous tip line to report unsafe working conditions, and reminding others who didn't experience this firsthand of the sacrifices made by minors. Everything changes, and 10 years later you look back on it, their lives are still, it's not healed, it'll never heal. That hurt will never heal. Uh, the only thing they can do is hopefully know that we made the changes that saved somebody else. And that's why I tell everyone, before you start trying to change the mining laws, the safety laws for miners, or any job, OSHA, any job, uh, please think about 
the price people have paid for those changes to come. We want to thank you for joining us this evening as we remember the 29 men and their families. We leave you this evening with the faces of the men behind these stories. Each picture a reminder of the heartache still felt so deeply by those who loved them and by a state still mourning 10 years later.